Oops. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Sorry for the wait, but there were some traffic problems. There was a bit of a jam around there, and they were oh, telling us not to close the doors and not to start yet. So sorry for those of you who were waiting. My name's Richard Bueno Hudson. I'm the executive director of Institute Cervantes. And I'm sorry, guys, I have you listening to my beautiful words. So I'm going to tell you what Institute Cervantes is. For those of you who don't know us, Institute Cervantes is uh, the cultural... Uh, uh, basically agency of the government of Spain, and it has a very clear mission, uh, which is, and with the, object, the objective is the promotion of the language and the Spani uh, Spanish language and cultures of Spanish-speaking countries. So what we do is we have uh, an academic program uh, where we teach Spanish, so for those of you who don't know where to learn Spanish, this is the place. And we've got a very rich and uh, uh, action-packed uh, cultural program. And Victor, my dear Victor, you are the closing event of the academic year, uh, of the actual year, 2023, so a big round for him. <laughs> So, so this is us. I'll come and I'll introduce them to you in a minute. Well, you obviously all know them, but uh, but uh, but yeah, this is us, Instituto Cervantes, and I'd like to thank a few people who made uh, this uh, exhibit possible. Huh? So we've got Silvia Longueira, uh, director of the Luis Seoane Foundation in A Coruña which supported the project and which uh, where this exhibition was inaugurated for the first time. There you go. We've got the Siddle Council, also I'd like to thank the Siddle City Council of Acoruña, owner of the collection on show of the artwork on display today, and which they have so kindly lent uh, for this tour in New York. Also, Acción Cultural en el Exterior, which along with Instituto Cervantes have made this exhibition possible and uh, along with the beautiful and excellent catalogue that you'll be able to see upstairs. And last but not least, our dear Dave, David Carvajal, the curator who's done an extremely good job upstairs. You'll see every single thing is in place, and you'll enjoy that. So, David, well done, wherever you are. Okay, so um, that's me for the night. We'll see you later upstairs after the conversation between these two magnificent, uh, well, our star tonight is Victor Moscoso, along with Mr. Stephen Heller. Thank you for coming. Thank you. The lights are now I can be I can hear myself. Uh, this is a real treat. The last time I saw Victor in person was over 30 years ago. He's gotten younger. Some of you may be here to indulge in a little hallucinogenic flashback. Others, I hope, are here to celebrate an iconic artist who helped define the modern aesthetic of the 60s, whose so-called psychedelic posters are as emblematic of their time and are now as timeless as A.M. Cassandra's was of his time and whose drawings are as fluid and witty as the great cartoon and comic artists of the Gilded Age. Victor Moscoso's work tends to be locked into a tight time frame, when in fact his art is open to all generations in its craft and ingenuity, while responding to social and cultural prompts of this time. I've come here not to relive 
my counterculture moments, because I can't remember them. <laughs> but to experience a great artist's incomparable work as abstract storyteller, inventive typographer, and daring colorist. Victor Moscoso was chief among the gra graphic maestros and principal form givers of the 60s. And this continues into the 2020s. He lived through the 60s and is still able to remember, which is amazing. The Spanish-born, Brooklyn-born, Brooklyn-raised, uh, Yale-educated artist stumbled into the counterculture and arose to become the genius. Notice I haven't compared him to other geniuses with whom he could share the stage. Of distinct American music-inspired graphic poster language. Although the movement's name was not coined by any of the artists involved in it, psychedelic aptly underscored the hypnotic letter forms and vibrating color combinations and retrofitted antique illustrations. They used their visual language as a code that vividly, vividly communicated to those visionary or stoned enough to see the messages through the chromatic haze. While many of the artists who were making cheaply printed flyers promoting ballroom concerts were ostensibly self-taught, their respective work unwittingly redefined a large swath of commercial art, graphic design, and fine arts too, even today. Moscoso was unique in ways that gave him anomaly status among his peers. He was the only formally art school and university trained artist in this otherwise grassroots poster movement. He really knew how to draw in a classical sense and he understood design theory. He had learned Bauhaus history and studied early and mid-century modernism. In short, Moscoso had bona fides. But this tenure at New York but his tenure at New York's Cooper Union and later at Yale, where he was taught by none other than the renowned color master and Bauhausler Joseph Albers, was not so much an advantage as a handicap. So to work in his newfound counterculture genre, he had to reverse everything he learned. I want to thank David for bringing this work into the light He's a fantastic curator, and I hope you'll look at the catalog, and I hope you'll get to see the show upstairs and spend time with it, uh, as the posters were meant to do. You had to look at them for 10 minutes to get their meaning. And thanks to Victor Moscoso for making an indelible mark on American art and design, and for allowing me to be his friend. It's in your hands now, Victor. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Steve. What can I say? <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to thank Stephen. He's a great guy. I also want to thank David. David Carvajal. There wouldn't be no show without David. David saw how I was going to Gallego. He saw the La Cruz, the Santiago de Compostela, and my beret. He said, hey, he was born in Santiago de Compostela. That's where this comes from, the shrine, Catholic shrine. And I'm, I'm not Catholic, man. I'm, no, but I come from Catholic Spain. Okay. Anyway. Luckily, I got the book after the Spanish Civil War. My father had been born in uh, New Jersey. Therefore, he's an American citizen. Uh, he had to lay low because we were Republicans. Oh, OK. All uh, right, sorry about that. Uh, OK, I lost my train. OK, I'll get back on to it. So. Your father was born in New Jersey. Thank you. We've been having this trouble all night. <laughs> My age. Uh, anyway, so came to Brooklyn 
I was three and a half years old. By the time I got to kindergarten, I already had, was fluent in English. Now, when I was a little bit older, my father told me that I, I didn't know I could speak Spanish because my parents spoke Spanish at home, and I only spoke Spanish to them. And Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad I have friends in New York. <laughs> so, you go into Spanish school so I could learn how to read and write Spanish. I said, oh, Pop, I don't want to go to Spanish school. I want to play stickball with my friends. After. This was in the evening. He said, no, no, you're going to go to Spanish school, and someday you're going to thank me. Well, years later, I said, Pop, thank you for sending me to Spanish school. Because I could read and write and speak Spanish. Thanks, Pop. <laughs> yeah. Then I got involved with school, which is all right, you know. Uh, oh, out of sight. Ah, good. This is a good idea. Yeah. Whoa. Thank you very much. Over here, okay? Yeah. All right. So, okay. I got involved with school, and I didn't like school. You know, who likes school? The only thing I liked about school was sports and girls. Math, uh, you know, drawing, uh, art classes. And there they had the materials in school, you know. And I learned how to get the materials. Whoops. Then Cooper Union. When I got to Cooper Union, I found a whole bunch of like-minded souls, like me. In my neighborhood, I was an oddball, as far as my art goes, went. But when I got to Cooper Union, I saw all those people like me, you know, just getting into this thing. And I noticed what they were doing. I was very impressed by the painting that was going on at that time. And so I decided, I'm going to be a painter. And from that point on, that's how I saw myself. And when I got to Yale, I was very lucky. I didn't want to go to Yale. I want to come to California. So I applied to UC in Berkeley. And they accepted me. I said, sure, come on out. Uh, I only had to pay a little bit of money because I was out of town. And out of town. Oh, boy. Got to Yale. Got to Yale. Oh, stay with Joseph Alves. He was a very good teacher. He knew how to tell you what to do so that you learned it. We have color aid paper, a stack of it, 100 sheets. Get all the different colors. And he gives us examples of it. OK, you're going to make this color look different by the background. You're going like, to make two different colors look the same. Stuff like that. Go crazy at night figuring these things out. So when I got to Yale, I studied this class with Neil Wallover, who had been a student at Cooper Union. But then I got to Yale, I got to study with Alvin himself. Whoops. And I remember one story. I'll tell about that. There's a girl in the back of the room. She's taking our notes. There's always one. Just, oh, Mr. Alvis, last week you said blah, blah, blah. And now this week you say blah, blah, blah. Which am I to believe? And without missing a beat, Alvis says, in that case, young lady, you have a choice. Oh, cool. I like that guy. I like him. I want to be like him, which I did do later on. Anyway, so then I'm going to California. I'm going to California. I'm a New Yorker, but I want to see California. I did see it. I fell in love with California. And I put my New York citizenship on hold. And after a while, I said, I have a family. Well, I was a Californian. But I still am a New Yorker. That will never change, because I was programmed that way. Well, except for one thing. I had learned, as a New Yorker artist, that if you want to make it, you have to make it in New York. And I believed it. So I went to California just to visit. But I found it so beautiful. It was remarkable. So I stayed. I went to school there. Oh, I got my draft notice after I've been there for a couple of months, you know. And 
So I had to go down to my draft board. Whoa, was that something? First thing you do is they take your clothes off, except for your drawers. Wow, pretty vulnerable, huh? And there's this guy at the desk with all this uniform on. And he says, okay, just add this just a little bit. He says, okay, he call you up, he's standing right in front of him. He says, do you have any scars? And he's supposed to say yes or no. If you say yes, you're supposed to show your scars. So he said, do you have any scars? Oh, this is what it is. If you don't have any scars, then you have to pull down your drawers so you can see if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. Oh, I want to go into the army. I really do. <laughs> so right from the draft board, oh, as I'm leaving, there's an Air Force guy. I couldn't fail the test. It was so simple. And he says, hey, you could. You can go into the Air Force and be a lieutenant. I said, thank you very much, I'll think about it. I went straight to the San Francisco Art Institute, and at that time, if you were a student in school, you got a 2S rating, you were deferred. Didn't have to go to the draft. Cool. I went to the Art Institute, first day of school. No, no, right after the draft board. And there was a nice old building, trees with fruit on them in the courtyard. They had a pool in the middle, but covered it with plywood, and it was, they had music playing, and there was this girl, pretty girl, dancing. I said, wow, this is it. So hell with the army. You know, I don't want to dig a hole and then dig another hole to put the dirt from the first hole into the second hole. So I went to the army, I said, great, great. Not the pressure. Oh, no, they've got pressure, of course. Everybody's got pressure. It's a different kind of pressure. And then I got out of school, you know. Yeah, and then I was making work, you know, work for myself, you know. So I'd have a portfolio, go around to different art studios, and they look at my portfolio, I had a nice portfolio. Yeah. And I said, oh, this is nice work, they said. But we can't use you, we don't have a job for you. I said, okay, can you give me names of somebody else that might see me? So you give me three, usually you get a couple of names, two, three names. So then I go to those two people, choo, choo, choo. After a while, I do the same thing. I got a good feel for what's going on. I was getting work, but not that much, not that much. Then along came the posters. And I looked at them at first and I said, kitchen table doodles. <laughs> I can do better than that. I saw a poster by Wes Wilson. It was taken from the back of a magazine. It's a headache cure. This guy's head, head like that. And I said, hmm, now this one's interesting. It's crude, but it's interesting. I can do better than that. So I did my first poster, The Stone Facade. My greatest failure. I was trying to make the lettering legible. And Professor Dowden's class at Cooper gave out the rules what a good poster is. A good poster should transmit his message quickly and simply. Hmm. The lettering should always be legible. Hmm. Do not use vibrating colors. It's irritating to the eye. Okay, now people had asked me, have I drawn on the acid? I did once. And when you start to draw on the acid's coming on, all of a sudden the paper's not paper anymore. You see the molecules. And the pen, I don't know what the pen was doing there. It was all irrelevant. It didn't make any sense for me to be drawing while I'm watching all this is happening. That was it, no. But what I learned from acid was, for me, taking gas was like falling down a flight of stairs. As I fell down the stairs, my arms would fall off, my legs would fall off, my head would fall off, and then I had to go back and put myself back together again. But I would never put myself back together the same. I would change it. Like I change legit. Lettering should always be legible to lettering should never be legible if you can get away with it. Do not use vibrating colors. I use vibrating colors all the time. I make each edge for a period of time. Each edge was a vibrating edge. Only the edges vibrate. Stained glass windows are beautiful, but they have lead, leading in between the colors. That kills the vibration. The vibration only happens at the edge, and it has to do with figure ground. When the two colors are so similar in value, different colors from the opposite end of the color wheel, but the equal in value, the dark to, dark to light, then your eyes cannot tell. Which is figure, which is ground. Oh my God. 
totally wrong, huh? Uh, never use, did I say legible letter? Yeah, I said that, and the other one's quickly and simply, forget it. The idea was to hang somebody up in front of that poster for as long as you could. Sorry. And, um, and that's what I did. By reversing all the rules that Professor Dowden had taught me at Cooper Union, Kaboom. in the group. At first, it didn't work that way because I was a snob. Hi, I'm from New York. Seven years of college, oh, five years. Seven years of college, I could have been a doctor. <laughs> okay. Here, Wes Wilson, who was the first guy that I saw that caught my attention. I dismissed all the advertising. The posters was the only form of advertising for the dance concerts. No radio, no magazines, no newspapers, nothing. Word of mouth and the posters. And the way they would do at the post at the dances, they would to clear out the hall of the, you know, Avalon and the film hall. They would give to the first people to leave, first hundred people to leave, we get a free poster. People started collecting the poster right from the get-go. So then 67 comes along. Haight Ashbury had been a lovely neighborhood prior to 67. In 1966 was the real summer of love. My wife and I got married in 1966. Oh, cool. And then the scene just exploded. I'm in Life magazine. I get half page. Peter Max says the full page. Huh. huh. I know. I know. He's got anyway, I worked for Peter Max once for the summertime. Daly, his partner, they were up in the 70s. 70s. Uh, his partner uh, had to go for uh, you know service. He was in the National Guard, something like that. So for a month he was gone. And Peter Max, they had these books, they were book covers that they were doing from Crow Collier Press. And that's what was my job. I was I was take the place of Tom Daly, is it? Daly Max? Daly. Yeah, Tom Daly. I never met him because he was away. And then before he came back, I left, you know. Peter said, okay, this is only for a month, so it's kind of good. And it took off, you know, Life Magazine. Oh, my God. Hey, Mom, get Life Magazine. I'm in it. <laughs> sure, get a couple of copies. And wow. I mean, my mother had impressed the neighborhood. Nobody had gone to college before me. I was the first kid from the neighborhood to go to college. And my mother said to me, what do you want to go to college? I had a full-time job doing terrible work. And I didn't like it, so that's when I decided to go to college. I needed more craft. So my mother says, what do you want to go to college for? You already got a job. I said, yeah, but I got to get more craft. I'm going to college, Mom. Sorry. And so it was free. Oh, cool for the union. Hey, man. That's one capitalist I love. Really. Women, no problem. Night school, no problem. Payment, no problem. It's free. He owned a lot that they built a Chrysler building on. Cooper Union owns a lot. What, are you going to move the camp? What, you going to move the building? Take it to somebody else's property? No. That's probably one of the reasons why I have a free education. Man. I couldn't have done it otherwise. I've been accepted to Pratt in Brooklyn. But I had to pay a lot of money. What was the, what choice did I have, man? Cooper Union, it's free. It's a good school. I got to Cooper Union, and I was impressed by what was going on. The painting just blew me away. People like me were doing, whoa. After expression was a big deal then. I was never abstract. I once did an abstract painting, just to try it. I did it. I looked at it, and I said, eh. Painted right over it. It wasn't for me. I'm figurative. When the Kooning lost his women, women on a bicycle, barely there, but she's still there. After that, eh, okay, eh, you know. Although Franz Klein had no problem with because he wasn't figurative either, you know. And what I liked about Franz Klein was that when I found out what he did, he got these little sketches. I thought he'd gone, done it. No, no, he got these little sketches, blew them, I had a projector, blew them up very carefully. 
copy this little sketch so that it looks real spontaneous. I said, wow, cool. I use the camera too. I had trouble doing likenesses, but when I take a picture, I do a cover for Jerry Garcia, okay? And it's a portrait, you know, he says, what do you want on the cover, Jerry? He says, I don't know, you do what you want. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do a portrait of you. Only his guitar. He says, Fing middle finger's missing. I says, so I had made sure, this is his identification, in case you didn't know his name. That's Jerry Garcia. So I'm not gonna ask Jerry Garcia to come over to my studio and sit for four hours so I can do a portrait of him. No way, he's too busy guy. So I have a camera. Okay, Jerry, stand there with the guitar in your hand. Click, okay, click, 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 click. Five minutes, that's all he has to do for the job. I ain't gonna ask him to pose for four, I'm just ridiculous, so no question about it. All right, so then I got into record albums and I got a call from, who was it? Headhunters, Headhunters. Herbie Hancock, yeah. and I give him a call. That, you know, his manager had told me that he wanted me to do the cover, and so I called up uh, Herbie. He was down that way at the, at the time, but he came up for the recording. And I said, "What's what are you doing? What's what's the music like?" He says, "Well, I don't have it yet, but I can tell you, it's a combination between." Modern electronics and African rhythm music. Cool. So I went looking through African masks. I found this moon mask. It was perfect. It had two knobs here and a mouth thing up with jagged lines. Okay, so with the mouth, I put a VU meter. And with the eyes, I put those twisted little numbers there. So if you look closely at it, this is a musical recording instrument. Did it for him. It was fairly easy. You know, simple idea. The mask, and behind him is, is Herbie, Herbie Hancock. And he actually was wearing his mask. Okay. That's published. It goes platinum. Platinum with my cover on it. <laughs> and for years, it was the largest selling jazz album of all time. Now it's the second largest jazz album of all time. Oh, well. It's still up there. These things kept happening to me. I wasn't looking for them. I was looking to do good work. You know, design is a job, and it's supposed to accomplish something. In the case of records, sell more records. In the case of the posters, well, hell, just sell the posters. You don't even have to adapt them. And boy, did they go well. I started my own company, Neon Rose because I didn't want to be indebted to Bill Graham or to Chad Holmes or anybody else. So that one I controlled entirely myself. I controlled the other ones too. Nobody ever saw it until it was printed. How about that? I had a job. They gave me the job and that was it. I turned, I'd hand it over, finished. Wow. That's a big change from what happened previously, you know, where I was a man on the totem pole. You know, what can I say? I was a very lucky guy. Oh, wait, one more thing. So, after the posters come the comics. I'm one of the artists in Zap Comics. A radical comic book. Uncensored. Really uncensored. Whoa. I mean, I said, I saw this one page uh, by S. Clay Wilson. I'm not going to describe the whole thing, but there's only six panels. And it's very graphic and very grotesque and very, what's what I say? Over the top. Over the top. I looked at it and I said, the title, I'm not going to describe it. The title is Heads First. Okay. It's a zap number two for those who are interested. Okay. And I realized when I saw that work of his, that's Clay Wilson that I and the rest of us had been censoring ourselves. Why had I never drawn a picture of a couple copulating? Was it I wasn't interested in? No, because I didn't think the market would accept it. Well, Crumb, by 
making it an independent comic. He paid for it. It was his comic. He copyrighted it. And Rick Griffin and I were, uh, had just started our work on a color comic magazine. We already had these facts. And in Saturn only two, you can see those panels, a lot of those panels. Okay, so. And not only did I see that I was censoring myself, but the artists, other artists saw it too. Okay, now the gloves are off. Anything is okay. I don't care. You know. Wow. Holy shit. The artists of Marvel Comics, excellent artists of what they do, don't have that control. It's not their work. It belongs to the company, either Marvel or DC or whatever. And here we had in Zap Comics, a publication, a comic book, that was owned by the artist. Owned by the artist. I copyrighted every issue. See, I had been burned a lot. And I started to learn a lot. And I was the business guy. I said, no, you got to copyright everything. Then later on, years later on, uh, I could see that Zap Comics was going to be taken by a movie. Somebody else will get it. And I can't copyright Zap Comics. Uh, but I can trademark it. I trademarked Zap Comics, the name. About three to four months later, my lawyer got a request from, let's see, a big company in, in LA. I got two letters from my lawyer got. They wanted to buy the name or use the name Zap Comics for Saturday morning children's program. Jeez. <laughs> and they couldn't get it because we had the copyright. Uh, trademarks. I had it trademarked. And they never said, okay, can we just buy it for a million dollars? No, no, none of that. This went away. Okay, good. Leave it alone. So we were getting paid for our comic book where we could do anything that we wanted to do, just like with the posters. With the posters, I never showed a sketch or anything to any of the any of the family dog people, not to the director, not to his assistant, none of that. The first time they saw it, it was already printed and trimmed, ready to take out and be posted. The artwork had to come in, for the posters, the artwork had to come in Monday morning. It could be first the film part, the stripping, color separation, you know, for, all from black and white artwork. And they didn't have to show it to nobody. I could do whatever I wanted to, and it was okay. Whew. That was a trip. I mean, to get that to that position where I could do whatever I wanted to and succeed and get paid for it, nice. That was a nice feeling. Yeah. And I'm glad I learned those lessons, you know. And the guy, the other guys, Boy, did they benefit from my experience there? Otherwise, somebody else would have had that comic. Zap comics, trademark would have gone to, yeah, I wish I could, William Morris. William Morris Agency wants Zap comics. Well, or give me an offer. No, they want it for free. No, sorry, it's ours. Okay, so, all right, that kind of takes me to, you know, I, I do a lot of other stuff too, like posters for this person, uh, films. For this people, I did a lot of other things because what I had done with the posters and the comics attracted a lot of attention, and and people would come to me and say, well, "You do this and this for," her. and I just found myself in a very fortunate place, being an artist who does what he wants, gets paid for it, gets paid for it. That's that's the kicker, you know. You get paid for. Oh wow, I can do more. And I mean the rest of it, you know. It's history, really, it's history. The posters didn't last that long. No, but they will last. Muka's posters didn't last that long either. <laughs> but they're here today. I, I looked at Muka's work. Amazing. I mean, I have a book, this, all posters, all got designs. No, no bright colors, very muted colors, very tasty, very tasty. His d details are amazing, you know. So I've copied him. In fact, I used his drawings on a couple of posters. But what I did for him, what, I do this line drawing that was Muka, but then I put my colors in. Muka never did a vibrating color poster. <laughs> very pastel -y. 
very tasty. Mine went blah, blah, blah. When I did those posters, I remember thinking, okay, what I do with these posters is I want to bring the people from across the street. And I had this coffee house, the Trieste Cafe. It was on Grand Avenue, old Vietnam haunts. And Boom. All right. So I would sit in the Trieste Cafe you know, when the posters were printed. And I, what they do, at first the posters went up on any place that they could put them up. But because they're going to be stolen, they had to put them in stores, in a store window up against the glass. With that situation, I could sit in the Trieste Cafe with my coffee and watch people go up and down the street. Choo, that one started. That one stopped. And I watched how long and where their eyes went. But my goal was to get the people across the street. I wanted them to cross the street, just look at the poster. You can't read it from across the street. You have to hold them right there next to it. Uh, and I would watch. And one time, I could see a response. Musicians have it, in a way, have it made differently. If I, when, and I was a musician for a period of time, playing at, uh, in the coffee gallery in old beatnik on. Um, Monday night, amateur night, they called it hoot night. And if you got up on stage, on a little stage, and you played 15 minutes worth of the song or anything, you get free beer. Okay. I remember practicing with a friend, a neighbor friend of mine. We each had a guitar, and we practiced Carter family songs. Uh, if you saw, uh, that kind of music, light gospel music, supposed to walk that's my plea, you know. I mean, atheist, but hey, those are beautiful songs. Yeah. And I got free beers. And I met Janis Joplin, Jerry Garcia. Jerry thought I was a great guitar player. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wish I had some recordings of my great music, and then it settled my mind. So I was a musician, too, and I was thinking, okay, I got good enough to where I... Okay, I could be a musician, but I need more craft of music, which means I have to learn music, read more. And the poster was starting to happen then. So I said, well, you know, more craft, shit, more craft. Don't get old, <laughs> really. Stay young, if you can, you know. And you can remember more that way. But, hey, I got here. I'm 87 years old. Yeah. Thank you. I can still walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and... And the work looks incredible upstairs. Thank you, it Steve. It looks like a body of intelligence. It's not just... Your, your body of work is done with flair, intelligence, and vibrance. It doesn't look like it was just tossed off as so many punk posters looked. Uh, you created a language you created a method of getting, making that language universal, even though it was meant for only a few. Yeah, it was local. And one of the things you did that I find fascinating is you never drew the letter, you drew the spaces between the letters. Yeah. Why well, did you first do that? I, I drew, first I drew the letter, then I realized, no, no, do the spaces. And make the spaces look like cactus. So they don't look like letters at all. In fact, there are no letters there. The only letters you can read are in between the spaces. <laughs> they didn't teach me that at Cooper Union. See, those things just came. It comes with the job. And what I owe a lot to is those Wes Wilson, Mouse and Kelly. Mouse had gone to a couple of years of art school. 
Wes Wilson had one drawing class, one drawing class at night. Kelly didn't draw at all, but he had good ideas. Mouse and Kelly, nice couple. Rick Griffin showed up. This was after. I thought all the big spaces were taken. I, I saw us as beach masters. You know, these big walruses that come up onto the beach. And the way it works with the walruses, they come up from the beach to mate. So then the females come. And what they do is they pick the walrus with the most space. Because they figure that's the strongest walrus. OK. So I figured, Wes Wilson, Master Kelly, and me. We were the walruses. We're taking over the beach. And along comes Rick Griffin, young guy. Tusk, tusk. <laughs> and so Rick Griffin comes on the scene. I learned from him. He was a cartoonist prior to that. And I learned from him when we were doing our work together. Remarkable, remarkable. Yeah. Tell them about the uh, collaboration where Rick did a poster with lettering that said nothing. That was the first poster I did with Rick Griffin. He had already done a number of posters, and he was one of the established early guys. They called us the Big Five. I like to join show artists because we got together for the show on, uh, in a downtown gallery, or uptown gallery, I mean, it was a regular gallery for non dope smokers and non acid takers, you know, drinkers, alcohol, and cigarettes. Cigarettes and whiskey. They'll make you crazy, they'll make you insane. Anyway, so I owe it to these self taught. I must have read an article about the process. These auto peripatetic artists. Auto peripatetic artists? What's that? I had to look it up in the dictionary. Self taught. I couldn't use self taught. And so, oh, okay. Self taught. These guys, they taught me how to do a poster. And then once they taught me, I then took it and I impacted them. Choo -choo. Haydn created the motet form for classical music. Mozart came on and used, used his forms, the motet form, four pieces, four, four steps, four parts, four chapters. And Mozart did much better than Haydn, I think. I mean, to me, Mozart is the one, Beethoven, okay, Bach, good. But Mozart, he makes it sound so easy. I love that when you do it. And I know it's not easy. They're so lyrical, so light. He can do anything he wants with that music. Wow. Much better than Haydn, in my estimation. So who comes first and who comes second? Eh, it's up to grabs. It's what you do with what you got. And so Rick comes on the scene. And he does his great posters, too. And then one day he shows up at my door. He's got his illustration board. It wasn't even a box. He just had an illustration board. And on it, he's asked this design. An oval, and he tells me, this is my idea. Because lettering was getting more and more illegible. You know, cactus that in between is the letters. It doesn't exist. And so he comes over and he says, and he had a pencil, an oval, with this lettering and this lettering on the bottom. Lettering on top, the lettering on top was inked. The black line was inked. The oval was inked almost all the way down, but not all the way. And he said, I'm doing a poster using letters that might be letters, but they don't say anything. They're not letters at all. They look like letters, like psychedelic lettering, but don't say shit. Excuse me, don't say anything. So I said, oh, great. Great idea. He says, but I don't know what to put in the middle. So I thought for just a second, I thought, well, oh, Rick, it's your poster. We'll do a picture of you. He says, OK, no problem. I got a piece of picture glass from a friend. And I held it up. I got a grease pencil, and I traced, I would trace Rick's face. OK, got it, Rick. So then I used that as my matrix for the design. And I made a face of him, you know, a face of him. But I bring parts of the outside of the lining into the thing. I work the things. 
he's spaced, in other words. Above and below are the stars, the universe. So it comes up. Okay, he didn't tell me what the bill was, and I realized later that who was playing. He said, said, well, I have the family dog logo down on the lower right. He's half off, and he has a word balloon with the bill. Who's there, what time, you know, blah, blah, date, place, time. And I didn't give it much more thought than that. When the poster was printed, I looked at the poster and said, oh, okay, here's the family dog logo, the word balloon. You know. Chuck Berry? Chuck Berry, one of the kings of rock and roll. And we did a portrait of Rick Griffin. And it went. It flew. It sold. If Sarah Bernhardt had given the commission to Rick for one of her, Giselle, one of those events, and Muga had handed a portrait of his friend or himself, and she would take it and say, fine, and it would work. No way. No way. But that's what we did with that poster. It was a poster for Rick, not for Chuck Berry. And it worked. Wow. Wow. How did that happen? Anyway, I don't have to question it because it worked well. After that, we did five more posters of collaborations. Excellent. I mean, see, with Mouse and Kelly, Mouse was the artist, the hand, and Kelly was the idea guy. Zigzag poster. Why didn't I think of that? Package of zigzag papers said marijuana on it. Not there, but anybody who looked at it, there was a smoker, saw grass. There was a store on Grant Avenue called Ken's. It was like a little tiny 7 Eleven. And they had a few things to sell, and they had cigarette papers. Anytime you want a cigarette paper, you go to Ken's. I have a feeling that Ken made half of his income off of cigarette papers, zigzag cigarette papers, because that's what the dope smokers rolled in. And I didn't think of it. And then, a couple of posters later, they come out with Skull and Roses. They got out of the Omar Khayyam. Is it Omar Khayyam? Uh, yeah. yeah. Just took it out, the book, photographed it, and altered it where necessary, colored it. And the Grateful Dead, from that poster, generated more merchandising than I can imagine. Because once Mouse and Kelly had put a skull next to a rose, it said, Grateful Dead. That poster established that for them. Wow, amazing. And they probably didn't get re royalties. We did. Uh, first time I spoke to Wes Wilson, I had done one poster, my greatest failure. But there were only three, uh, one, two, three, four. Master Kelly, Wes Wilson, and myself had done posters at all. So Wes was said, well, the other artists uh, were going to um, ask for royalties. He did that or go on strike. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of silly, but OK. It worked. We had 20% royalties. We were supposed to get 20% royalties. Never happened. One of the things about being well known or selling, in other words, where you become popular with your work. We got ripped off royally. And that's even with me, with my best business head, going, but what the hell, man? I have to go look at the books to find out. For that, you need a lawyer. Oh, boy. You want to give money away? Get a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, we sued Chet Helms. Ted Helms, after leaving town, disappearing for a number of years, came back, and behind our backs, we were working, it was our copyright to the posters. And the people that wanted to use our posters called the artist that did that poster. I said, yes, no, maybe, how much? Okay, so we did that, and we got 20%. We were supposed to get 20%. We got screwed financially from what was due us to what actually got to us. Welcome to the club, artists. Artists. OK, I'll give you my theory about how that works. OK. When Martin Luther nailed that thing to the church door, saying, hey, no graven image, none of that shit, man, none of that. 
the Protestant bought it. One of the things they did, they burned up the paintings. How many, did they burn up any Vermeers, any Rembrandts? I don't know. No, only if it was religious. And then they whitewashed the churches. Oh, my God, the artists. I mean, with Catholic Church, the artists had a job. With the Protestant Church, with children. Artists are children because they enjoy what they're doing. No, no, no. No, no, you're a Protestant. If you didn't enjoy what you're doing, it should be painful. Artists, therefore, are not adults. They're children. They're playing with things that they like. Most of the capitalists have to do these jobs because that's how they make money. Well, that's how we make money, too, but not that much. Anyway, so I learned a lot. When you get burned, you learn, you know, and you learn not to do that again. But you're always going to get burned because, you know, are you a watchdog or are you an artist? You know, hire a lawyer. Oh, boy, how to get rid of your money fast <laughs> with no results. I can't do that in my profession. You can't either. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Sure. But I want to ask you one quickie. You, upstairs, there's a wall full of images that came to you. They weren't given to you. They were for bands. They were for bands as iconic as The Birds and Grateful Dead. And you did images that you wanted to do. Yes. Today, Beyonce and Madonna and Lady Gaga are all branded. And it comes from a central office. How did you come up with those ideas that had nothing to do with the bands? And oh. Maybe even nothing to do with the music. No, 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 no. I was doing a poster. I decided what would go on the poster. I had that kind of freedom because my posters were selling. Luckily, neither Chet Helms nor Bill Graham. Bill Graham was the troublemaker. He wanted to make the lettering legible and that. But Wes ignored him, thank goodness. And finally, when Bill saw that these things were selling, he said, OK, I'll leave them alone. You know, I won't mess with a good thing. And what was the question again? How did you get away with it? Because the posters were selling so well. That's why. When the poster, I don't have the figures, man, but it was like through the roof. For my days, my time, I never, I never thought of being a poster artist and doing whatever I felt like on the poster. No. What happened then, it's like a state of grace fall of San Francisco. It couldn't have happened in LA, it couldn't have happened in, well, it could have happened in New York, but didn't. didn't. In L.A., they might have done a little bit like that with billboards. Nobody walks the sidewalks in L.A. They have sidewalks that go down the street. I mean, I, I had to take a walk through the town, uh, through these neighborhoods to get to the freeway where I was hit and I'll arrive back to San Francisco. And they have the little narrow sidewalks. Nobody walks on them anyway. They're all in You're walking on the side. A million people pass you in a minute or in an hour, whatever. Nobody passes you on the walking. So I, it couldn't happen in L.A. Because this, the post is, you have to walk up to them. Up to them. You can't do that with old boys. <laughs> Gone. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen any place else. It happened in San Francisco. I was lucky. I was there. You left your art in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, Let's take some questions. There's got to be some out there. Over there, I see one blooming. Hi, Victor. Nice to meet you. Uh, no, uh, you stand up. All right. All right, I can do so. I'm an old fucking man. All right. Hi. Nice to meet you, Victor. Um, I was curious. Um, you know, you started your Neon Rose. You were one of the first to really monetize your um, 
art with the Matrix. And uh, I was just curious if you could tell me a little bit about that. And, um, you know, um, you were just one of the most seminal artists, as far as I'm concerned, of the quote unquote big five, although I think it should include a few women. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you. Okay. So you want to hear about Matrix? Matrix. Right. Okay. So I had. First post I did, Stone Sun. I did an early part of 66. For the next five months, I didn't do a post. I was, because it was, I considered the Stone Facade a failure. It didn't do what I wanted it to do. I had missed the boat. In fact, I felt like the guy in the ballad of the Thin Man. Something is happening, but you don't know what it is. Do you, Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones became, do you, Victor Moscoso? Wow, what happened? Seven years of college, I've been a doctor. And these self-taught autopilotatetic artists. Anyway, so finally made, made the grade. And I did a number of excellent posters, finally. I got it. By watching Wes, Mouse, and Kelly. Because of them, I owe a great debt to them. And Okay. Like I said, I didn't want to be indebted. I didn't want to be dependent on Bill Graham or Chet Helms with the family dog. I wanted to be my own boss of my own company. So I started Neon Rose. And very little time at all, man. Oh, I, I went to the Matrix. Yeah, I'm saying, okay, what venue am I going to be advertising? So I considered, and I thought, okay, the Matrix. The Matrix has the same artist. Bill Graham and Chet Helms, Family Dog and Bill Graham have. You know, Big Run and Hogan Company, um, Jefferson Airplane, um, and the other, you know, later on, the Young Bloods from New York. What the posters did is they were like flags. Say, hey, look what's happening here. Look what's happening here. And the artists came streaming into San Francisco. Robert Crumb. So Rick Griffith posted him. That was a comic strip poster. He was so impressed by it, in Zap number one, he did a story about it. He did a comic strip for that one. Okay, so I went to the Matrix, and I said, hey, I already had some, done some nice posters, so they knew who I was. I said, and it was two, two guys who ran the place, and I said, how would you like me to do posters for the Matrix? She would like it, but we don't have that one. We don't have that kind of money. I said, don't worry about it. I'll do, you give me the bill, I'll do a poster for you, and I'll give you 200 posters free. And I will do what I want with the rest. And I could reprint them as my copy. So I said, sure. I didn't have any money. I'm doing it for free. With conditions. My own company. Now I'm free. I'm family dog. I'm free. I'm the grand. I never used them again. I went out. And I used them for a little while. That stopped because I didn't need them anymore. But the Neon Rose series, which is, you know, it wasn't, it was just me. The family dog, you got a lot of different artists, you know, very different. And it was, I kept doing family dog posters, but I was also doing the Rose posters. And I even did a Bill Graham poster when Rick approached me with, hey, I got two posters for Bill Graham. It's uh, Jimi Hendrix and the Iron Butterfly, two separate posters. Jimi Hendrix, wow, with Rick Griffin. The hell with the royalties. I'm gonna do it anyway for the poster itself. We did it. It's up there. What's not out there is the other poster for the Iron Butterfly. They reprinted Jimi Hendrix many times. But the Iron Butterfly never went once. That was it. So I'm glad I did it with Rick. Nice poster. Yeah. And so I kept, I kept relations with the family dog, but I had my own company. So if it stopped with the family dog, I could continue with the Neon Rose. 
200 free posters. That's what it cost me. I had to pay for the posters. But at that time, I remember, in order to make the unit cost, the cost of each unit, each poster, cost 10 cents. 10 cents to me. It sold for a dollar. 90% markup. Wow. Wow. So Pardon I raised me it. for interrupting, but a dollar? Wow. Wow. <laughs> it worked. It worked. Everything that you would try at that time, providing you in the right range, you know, right? Worked. A legible post that said nothing worked. Wow, go figure. Oh, well, I guess they read the blur at the bottom. <laughs> Anyway. Let's, let's take another question. Sure. Got a mic in my hand? Is this on? The red shirted fellow over here. Sorry. One, two. I think it's red. I just oh. uh, can't get the other. Oh, is this thing on? Can you hear it? Okay. Uh, my quick question uh, just, I don't, do you want me to take this or do you want to? Okay. Um, I know you don't probably pay attention to a lot of the new artists that are out now, but I'm yes, curious. You do? Yes, I do. Oh, great. Can you tell me if anyone right now, just a name, an artist who impresses you, these new young kids like, you know, David Welker, and you got, you know, the new uh, Jim Pollock, and you got a lot of other new artists that are now coming out doing artwork for these big bands, and what do you think about it all? And well, it depends on the artist. If the artist is good, I like his work. It's just, does anyone come out right now that you remember? You know, I, 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 I've seen work, new work. I check it out. Right. You know. Yeah, Emic. Emic, he's good. Yeah, he's good. Go ahead. He's very. What he does is good. Yeah. Uh, what, what he's also done, which I'm impressed by, he has a, a following, a clientele. Yes. That pays very close attention to him, and whatever he's doing. And when we have, uh, there's an event that's called the, the uh, trips. Trips. The Rock Poster Society. Yep. San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why did I say that? You were talking about Emic in San Francisco. Emic, okay. Yeah. So I see, I see their work. I don't have that many names. I mean, I'm not following them. Did you go to the last trip show in San Francisco and yes. walked? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. Cool. I was there. Good. Good. Were you there? Yes, I was. Yes. Oh, you I saw hello? you. Oh, everybody, everybody wanted to say hello to you. I was, you know, just kind of keep my distance. I like to respect okay. everybody's okay. space. Uh, one last question. Sure. Back then, you were talking about your printing costs at ten cents, which is like unbelievable for silk screening. If you think about it. No, not silk screening. Oh, just regular offset. Offset lithography. Okay, great. Printed on I I T I. I think it's like eight. Do you get the initials? Super cheap. Do you remember who you were using? Like, was Toulouse Lautrec involved with any of his presses? One of my posters. I didn't like Toulouse Lautrec because when he ran a poster, he would run off a batch for himself that I'm paying for. Get out of here. I used him once, that was it. I went to California Litho Plate. Who's over here? Here's the mic. Um, I'm curious, did you go on press with your posters? No. And did you ever do more than one colorway? Or did you choose just one color combination for each poster? Did you ever try? Like yes. I did one poster. It was for the Blues Project. And I had a nice, beautiful young lady. Sitting like this. Gorgeous. I saw that photograph in uh, my friend, Hack Clyvan. He did the cat books. And so I photograph, I said, hey, can I use that? Beautiful girl. I want to do pinup. And he said, sure, take it. I took it. And I, I was, at that point, I was really into the vibrating colors. Every color would have to vibrate with every other color on that page. Maximum vibration. Just what they told me not to do at Cooper Union. I should have written Professor Downer. <laughs> I should have sent him a poster. What do you think it is? And, yeah. He probably saw it and is rolling over in his. And says, oh my God, what has he done to my teacher? Well. <laughs> my God, he's doing posters? They're supposed to be terrible by the rules, you know? Well, what did it, what, what are rules? Yeah, and I realized one thing. 
everything gets to be, what do you call it, when it gets established. Then it gets set in cement, so to speak, you know. And nah, that's, that's death. So being an artist, that is death. You have to have the ability to breathe, you know, into your work. If you can't do that, I've done jobs where I hated them. I did this one job for a textbook company. Terrible. I looked at my work, it was terrible, but I got paid $7,000 for it. Whoa. Once I got the check, and then went down to my studio, because that was good three months, I wouldn't have to work in those days. And I sat down, papers, my cards, my papers, either typewriter paper or eight by 10 cards or five by eight cards, smoke a joint, try not to think about anything. I've heard about this before, but I wasn't able to do it until then. And then I start, with no idea, that was the idea. I have no idea. I start in the upper left-hand corner, usually, I scribble. And all of a sudden, the scribbles will tell me something. This is a man, this is a dog, this is something, this is a building. And then I get it, okay. But it kept telling me each step of the way. Okay, now you do this, now you do this. The two of them was telling me what to do. I loved it, really. When the talk, when your drawing talks to you, you're doing very well, <laughs> really. As long as you haven't been diagnosed with some other disease. Eh, I know, I know, but it feels good, yeah. So, okay, I don't know if I answered, I forgot the question. <laughs> okay, it, well, it's me party pooping again. So I'm sorry, I need to interrupt this. I suppose we could be here forever listening to this, such an interesting conversation. So. Let's first give him a, a huge round of applause. Hey, Victor, you've done it once again. You've got a house full. How about that? That's amazing. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys just a f two moments of your lives right now. Stay in your seats while Mr. Moscoso and the rest of us go upstairs, and then you can all follow us, and we'll meet you upstairs in the gallery where uh, David Carvajal will explain the exhibit to all of you, and you'll be able to contemplate all the beauties and wonders that await you upstairs. Okay? So if you can please stay here for two minutes, we'll all... Uh, slowly, you can take, either take the elevator or the stairs to the gallery. Mm -hmm. Just one second. Thank you very much.